Hello and welcome everyone to our first live stream of the quarterly Onshape review. We're really excited about the new platform and we're really excited to be bringing you all the new updates in the last quarter. Uh, I'll dive right into things with simple introductions. For those that don't know me, my name is Cody Armstrong. I'm the Senior Director of Technical Services on the Onshape team here at PTC. And I'm very fortunate to be joined by the Onshape Head of Product, Greg Brown. Hi, Cody. Hi, everybody. Great to be back here again. Yeah, this is an exciting presentation as always, and I know we always say that, but this one in particular, I think you're going to be really thrilled with, and not to give too much away, but make sure to stay to the end, because we have some really awesome presentations, not to spoil it, but Greg has some awesome stuff planned as well. Okay. All right, so for those new to um, the quarterly Onshape review, what we really like to do is give you both the what and the why for Onshape product improvements. We really want to explain not only what has been added in the last quarter, 90 days or so, but also give you a bit of context to why. What are the use cases? What are the applications? And, and what does it mean strategically for Onshape uh, to be focused on these areas? And so it's just a bit more context versus what you might see in a traditional, like what's new blog post or forum post that we release every three weeks. And that's the idea is give you a little bit more detail and you know have uh, us go into a little bit more depth on the features and the use cases and, and um, the reasons uh, for why. And you know as we always do, our favorite part of this is to discuss what has been improved. And, you know, the demonstrations are obviously our favorite part. We're going to go through a handful of those. Um, but we also want to focus on the why. And why are these improvements uh, in focus? Why are we spending our energy on them? And, and what were the uh, reasons behind you doing these things? The use cases, um, the, the strategic focus as a business for what we're doing. Uh, so we always like to give just that little bit more extra context that you wouldn't necessarily get in a what's new blog post or what's new forum post. Which, quick plug, if you're not already uh, checking our forum posts or a blog post on a regular basis, uh, the what's new forum post, the what's new blog post, definitely worth following. All right, so where are we at so far? And we always like to show this chart because it gives you an idea of the depth and the, the quantity of, of features that are being released in Onshape. This is 2024 so far, right? So we're three and a half months in and we've already got four updates. In fact, since our last uh, presentation, since our last uh, quarterly review in December, we've actually had five updates. And so we have five updates to pick from. And what you'll see here is just a, a running tally of some of the biggest improvements, not all of them, but some of the biggest improvements that we had in 2024. And the thing I would stress is that the, the uh, pace or the cadence of releases is only accelerating. And you're going to see a lot of that here today. Um, yeah. So as Cozy said here, you know, this is just really cherry picking. And I think we say this every time, you know, we do this quarterly review, but every, we're just cherry picking. You know, there could be four or five others that we put on on any given release as well. That are significant things people have been asking for, things that we want you to have. Um, but these are the ones that we've kind of focused on for this um, quarter before us. Yeah. Yeah, and that is a hard thing to do to to cherry pick down the the features because there's so many in in the each one of these updates. And even what you're seeing here isn't everything right these are just a yeah. handful and what we've tried to do is pick from the handful a handful to show you live some of our favorites and some that we think will have the biggest impact but the most important takeaway from you know any of these presentations but in particular this slide is that we're moving really quickly uh, we have constant updates in fact we just had an update last friday um, and and you know we're really excited about the new stuff we're bringing you so what has happened in the last quarter. And it's winter here in the US, so we refer to it as an avalanche of improvements. And there's a ton of stuff here, from everything from sheet metal to part studios, surface modeling, as well as general usability and user experience, things that have, uh, impact everyone in every application. And as always, an increased focus on drawings. So lots and lots of energy spent on drawings. We won't have time to go through all the improvements that, that are mentioned here, um, but just know that these are the areas that really got a lot of focus over the last quarter. Um, so let's dive right into it. Let's go. And what I'd like to do is start with 
something I think a lot of people will really care about, and that is sheet metal. So I want to start with a handful of sheet metal improvements that I think for those out there really doing a lot of sheet metal will appreciate. And the first is sheet metal bin. And I can think of all of the sheet metal improvements that have uh, been submitted over the last you know, nine years or so. This is definitely one that's very, very high on the list. The ability to you know, sketch geometry or use reference geometry to define where a bin takes place. And that's really what sheet metal bin gives you. It allows you to create a sheet metal bin with reference geometry. You can sketch that geometry or use any other kind of reference, but it, it makes it very quick and easy to define where a bin happens. And there's lots of applications for this actually, but one of the most common is working with imported flat patterns. So if you find yourself working with imported flat patterns, someone sent you like a DXF of a sheet metal part and it's in a 2D you know, format, this is a great tool to convert that into a 3D folded model in Onshape. Now there's lots of other applications, but I think that's the one that I would really highlight because I think it's very, very common. And it's one that we heard a lot from, from our customers. The next sheet metal improvement that I'd really want to focus on is the ability to add counterbores or countersinks to sheet metal parts. And this is something that many have requested for some time now. And that is the ability to just have a counterbore or countersink in a sheet metal part, and more importantly, have it show up in the flat pattern, in the flat view and on shape. And that is now supported. So when you go to create a whole feature and you create, you know, counterbore or countersink, you can now choose sheet metal parts. In the past, that was a limitation. And more importantly, it means you no longer have to finish the sheet metal model to create the, the uh, counterbore or countersunk holes in that sheet metal part. And that's really critical, of course, if you're, you know, go laser cut those sheet metal parts and you need those whole positions or, um, you know, subsequent manufacturing operations downstream, it's important to have those details in the flat pattern. So no longer necessary to finish the sheet metal model. You can now create counterbores and countersinks inside of, or in sheet metal parts. So those are the two big sheet metal improvements that I would mention. I'm going to go through these slides uh, kind of quickly here, but then I'm going to go through a demonstration and show you each one of these uh, in a little bit more depth. The next area that I would really want to focus on is just the general part studio. I think this is something that, that um, could have the potential to impact a lot of people. And that is the ability to insert a part studio as rigid. So what it means by that is you can now insert a part studio into your assembly that will update should you change you know, that part studio. It will add new parts. And I should clarify that we've always had the ability to insert part studios into the assembly. And when you make changes to those parts, they update in the assembly. What's different here is that when you insert a new part, when you create a new part in the part studio, that part is also automatically added to the assembly. And that wasn't the case in the past. And, and it's still an option whether you choose to do that or not. And I think there are certain applications where it really makes sense. But that's the important thing to stress is if you're in a situation where you find yourself adding or removing parts to a part studio and you just want the assembly to automatically reflect those changes, this is where um, you're going to find, this is what you're going to find useful. The ability to check that box that says rigid and insert that as a rigid part studio. Now, I should stress that, you know, yes, when you add new parts, they will automatically be added to the assembly if it's defined as rigid. But the opposite is also true. If you remove parts from the parts studio, they will also automatically be removed from the assembly. Um, so it is, in essence, you can think of it as a parametric link to the parts studio. Um, and any parts that are added or removed uh, are automatically reflected or updated in the assembly. So inserting parts studios of rigid, definitely something I think a lot of users will appreciate. Now, the next one that I would mention is one that was highly requested. Again, when we go back to the list of most requested features, this was definitely in the top five, maybe top 10, um, and that is decals. So like the name implies, it allows you to add a decal to your part studio in the form of images. Uh, various image formats are supported and it's very easy to do, but more importantly, you can now easily just drop in an image onto your part studio to do a number of different things. Um, the most important thing, the question that we get asked most often is, um, does it 
Is it also visible in the assembly? Is it visible in the drawing? And the answer is yes. So not only do we have decals in the part studio, but when you insert those into the part studio, they are also visible in the assembly. And they're also visible in shaded drawing views, right? So if you have a shaded drawing view, you have a decal, it will automatically be visible. Um, and I think there's really a handful of applications for this, but the one that we heard, or the, the handful that we heard most commonly were company logos, and things like warning and hazard labels. And there's a lot more, but I think those kind of uh, make up the majority of, of use cases for decals. So if you have an application where you want to insert your company logo into a part studio, or you want to insert warning or hazard labels into a part studio, uh, you can certainly do that. So let's dive into some of these improvements. I'm going to jump over to first uh, the sheet metal bend. And I, I really want to take a moment to explain where I think this could be useful. And I think the most common application is when you're working with a imported flat pattern. And very commonly, you'll get like a DXF or a DWG of a flat pattern. And it'll come in looking something like this. If I just roll back, you essentially just have a flat uh, it comes in as a sketch. When you insert it into a part studio, the DXF that you've imported, it looks like this. It looks like a, a flat sketch. And oftentimes what you need from this is the ability to take this and turn it into a folded 3D sheet metal part that it, you saw just a moment ago. And that workflow in the past has been kind of cumbersome because we didn't have an easy way to find a reference and bend around that thing. But now we do. So I'm going to show you a, a workflow for taking this imported DXF that I could have gotten from a supplier or vendor or something like that and converting that into a 3D, you know, uh, folded sheet metal part and unshaped. So the first step in this is to just create a sheet metal model. And we can just choose thicken and say, okay, I want to thicken all of these regions, right? And in this case, we're just defining kind of the shape of the flat pattern. And so all we're really doing in this case is just thickening the flat, flat, the flat pattern to the thickness of the finished sheet metal part, right? With those details here. That's not new. We've had the ability to do that for some time. What is new is now I can take this, this uh, flat pattern and bend it, right? And so what you'll see is a new icon in the sheet metal tools called bend. Very simple, you select bend, and you select your bend line. So I select a bend line, and it bends about that line. So it's really a, a very simple feature to use. You just select the reference that you want to define, and it bends about that reference. You have very similar options to other features in sheet metal. So you have bend angle, bend alignment. It does use the default values that you've established in the sheet metal model for bend radius and K factor. And you could, of course, set the angle. One thing that I think is really is unique to this feature that you won't be aware of is the, uh, the hold opposite side. Because a lot of times when you're bending from a flat, it can bend one of two ways, and that's essentially what this gives you, the ability to flip what is defined as the hold side. Um, and so just depends on the orientation of the model. Obviously, in this situation, the default was fine, but if it wasn't, I could go through and um, flip that to the opposite side. And so from here, I just hit the green check, OK. And now I've got the first bend in my bent sheet metal part. And so I can go back to find another bend. And it's really just a matter of selecting the line. And it will find it, add the bend with this default details that I'd find. I can hit OK. Now, that's sheet metal bend. I want to add just one pro tip with respect to this feature, but also other features. If there's any other features that you use, bend is a good example, but also like fill it or other features where you use a lot back to back in succession. A tip that I have for you is, you know, let's say that I have bend and I want to create another one. So I select the bend line. It creates a bend that looks good, but I need to do that, you know, maybe 10 more times. What I can do is hold down shift and hit enter to accept the bend feature. And it automatically brings back up the bend dialog. So I don't have to go back to the toolbar and find bend. And so what it means is in this kind of a workflow where I'm just selecting an edge and, and defining a, a bend around that, I just use shift enter to accept and move right onto the next one. And I can get through this really quickly uh, just by you know, selecting my bend line, shift enter to accept it and move on to the next one. And so it means that you know, I can go from a 
you know, flat pattern that someone sent me in the form of a TXF, bring that into a sketch, you know, and, and convert that to a real folded sheet metal part in really just a couple of minutes. Right. Um, so that's the new sheet metal bin feature. And the tip that I have, and it's universal throughout on shape. If you hold down shift and hit enter, it accepts the feature and brings the dialogue back up really neat and really useful in applications like bend and other places. But um, that is sheet metal bin. That is one that I know a lot of users are going to be really excited about because it's one of the most requested sheet metal features that we've had in some time. So very cool. All right, the next one, another sheet metal improvement to mention is sheet metal countersink. This is another one that's really important for people creating sheet metal parts. You need to not only be able to create the countersunk holes or counterboard holes, but also have the position reflected in the flat pattern. That's equally important. And so if we bring up, let's open up that flat view. Here we have the flat view of the, the base piece of this sheet metal housing. And what I want to do is create a hole feature, of course, and define a countersink. Right? So we can say countersink and define my size. And it's really no different than applying any other hole. It doesn't work any differently. It just now supports countersunk and counterboard holes in sheet metal. Right, So I can very quickly select my point. And you can see as I'm doing this, as I go to select those points for each of the countersunk holes, it automatically adds the details to the flat view. Right, And so you can see those holes are being added to the flat view as I add them into uh, the folded state of the model uh, because of our simultaneous sheet metal view. And the big thing I would stress is now you get those whole location, the whole information in the flat pattern so that if you go to export this to a DXF, if I need to send this out to you know a, a water jet or laser cutter, someone is going to nest it, the, the whole locations become really important in those situations. And now you can have that, that whole information in the flat pattern, which is something that I know a lot of users will, will really appreciate. So that is countersunk holes. Counterbore holes apply the exact same way um, and, and also are now supported. So those are the two sheet metal improvements that I really wanted to take a moment to highlight because I know there are a lot of sheet metal users out there who will really appreciate them. The next one that I want to take a moment to address is a general part studio level improvement. So I think this is going to apply to a lot of, of different audiences out there, a lot of different groups, um, because it's really a tool for um, general part studio use. Right. And so let's say, for example, you know, I've designed this is a combination of regular features and frames and I've built this um, concrete bucket and I need to assemble it with other hardware and maybe, you know, goes into a skid or some other pieces. So this is just my part studio. But what I want, my intended behavior is as I change this part studio, I would like the assembly to automatically update. And that's always been true for parts you've inserted. Right. So if I insert parts from the part studio and I change them, they will update in the assembly. What's different is if you add new parts or if you remove parts, they will automatically update in the assembly. So let's discuss what this looks like. I'm going to create a new assembly just from scratch. And of course, I want to insert the part studio. What you'll notice is different is this icon in the insert dialog. It says insert entire part studio as rigid. And like the name implies, once you click that, you're only inserting everything in the part studio, right? So once you choose that, it, it highlights just the part studio level. And from there, it's really just a matter of clicking on the part studio the same way that you would in the past, right? We've had the ability to insert the part studio as a whole in the past, but it hasn't been rigid, right? So let's do that. Let's insert the concrete bucket. I'll go ahead and accept and we'll hide those make connectors. And so now I've got the concrete bucket in and I can add my hardware. I can add all the other various pieces that make up this assembly. The most important thing is I've defined this now as rigid. And you'll see a small icon change in the instance list. But the most important difference is when you make changes to the Part Studio, right? And in particular, when you add new parts to the Part Studio. I think that's the, the distinction that I've drawn and, and, the, and the important thing to remember with rigid uh, part studios is is it's really looking for changes in the individual parts and the number of them. And so in this case, what I need to do is add some parts. Let's just say that I'm going to add an additional cross member and I need to add some handles that that, uh, that 
you know, attached to this concrete bucket. And so basically the scenario is I've inserted in the assembly, but I'm not done modeling in the parts studio yet. And I expect the two to remain uh, synced in, in all ways, right? And so in this situation, I'm just going to add a handful of features here, just going to roll down through them just for the sake of time. And you'll see it adds an additional cross member. It adds handles that didn't exist in the past. So I've gone through and I've added a number of parts to this part studio. Now in the past, if you wanted those parts to be in the assembly, you would have to go to the assembly, insert and choose those parts from within the part studio to be dropped in. But with this update, when you go to the assembly, because it's defined as rigid, they are automatically added to the assembly, right? So that's the important thing to take away is, if that's your expectation, if, if you're inserting a part studio and you know that you're going to keep modifying it and you know that you want it to update wherever you know, the assembly is it's inserted, use rigid and, and it will allow you to, um, to get that expected behavior. So it really does depend on the workflow and the individual. Some people prefer this. Some people prefer using it, I would call the, the, you know, the way that we've had for some years now. Um, but I do think there's value in it if your expectations are that this will change and I expect that to update in the assembly. So it really does depend on the environment and what you're doing, but I think it is one that many people will take advantage of. So that is insert part studio as rigid. The next uh, improvement that I want to cover and is one that I think a lot of people are going to get really excited about. I know that when we talk to customers out there uh, and we do all the time, this was one that, that was really well appreciated and that is decals. So I'm gonna switch tabs here to, in this case, this is a scanned mesh uh, crankcase cover and we're building the cover plate over it. And so of course, what I wanna do here in this example is insert a company logo. Um, so really, I think there's there's two big applications for decals. I know there's many others, but I think the two big ones would be um, you know, company logos and defining labels and warning labels and, and other things that you would see on your product. And I want to show you an example of both of those. So in this case, I have a crankcase cover. It's a nice machined billet aluminum and I want a machine or I want to see, you know, my company logo in that uh, billet face cover. Now, the, the first step before you can insert a decal, it's important to stress, is you must insert the image into the document, right? In this case, it's just a PNG. There's a number of different supported formats, but it's important that the image be inserted into the document before you try to insert as a decal, right? An important prerequisite. And I'd also say the same thing a, a moment ago about DXFs. I showed you an example where I converted a DXF into a folded sheet metal part. Well, the DXF needed to be inserted into the document first. So it's important to remember that, insert the image first, then go to your parts studio where you want to insert it and you will see a new option for decal. So you choose decal, select your image, and it's going to you know, select the tab, in this case, the PNG that I have here. Then it's just a matter of defining the face. So it's very, very simple. You just click on a face and it adds the decal, right? So it's very, very easy to use. Now, by default, it's going to center the image and it's going to expand the image to match the boundaries of the face that you've selected, which in this application is perfect. It's exactly where I want the logo. But if I don't want it that size or if I want to move it around, it's very easy just to use the manipulator and grab and drag and shift this around, right? So important to stress, you can move things around. You can adjust the width. One very important option I think a lot of people are going to appreciate is the realign because it allows you to select reference geometry and say, this is what I want it to be realigned with or aligned my, my decal with. Um, but that's inserting decals. You just make sure the in, in, uh, image is inserted, select your decal feature and select the face. And it's, it's very, very simple. Um, so that's decal. I'm gonna go ahead and accept that. Now, one question that comes up is, well, what about the assembly? And what about drawings, right? Decals are important in a lot of different places, not necessarily just the part studio. And that is supported as well, right? So I switched over to the assembly for this crankcase and you can see the decals visible there. And if I switch over to the drawing, uh, you'll see the same is true of that. Now I should point out that these are shaded drawing views, 
right? So you won't see it in, in non-shaded drawing views, but for shaded drawing views, the decals show up uh, and you don't need to do anything special. They're just there. So that is uh, the decals, in particular, the application of kind of a company logo. I do think there's another application that, that is very common. I think a lot of people are going to appreciate, and that is things like warning and hazard labels and, and those kinds of stickers that you want positioned in an appropriate place, uh, maybe for assembly processes or just for realization, you know, to have the most real model possible. You want those labels there. And so in this situation here, I have an inverter and I've imported a warning label, an electrical warning label. And very simple, again, the same process as just a moment ago. I hit decal, I choose my image, we'll choose the warning label, and I select the face. Now, in this situation, like I mentioned before, it automatically centers the decal on the face and expands it to match the boundaries of the face, uh, which in our last example was perfect. But in this example, you can see I need to, to do some manipulation with the actual decal. But it's very simple. I can change the width if it's a little too big. That's easy to scale down and grab and drag. And I can also just rotate it around if I need to, right? So if I need to change this around, it'd be 90 degrees. It's very easy to grab and drag the manipulator and do that. I do think you're going to use realign quite often. If you need to align this with surrounding geometry, that's the most effective way to do that. Uh, but if you're just looking for simple positional movements, the manipulator is, is really good for that. Uh, but that's really decal. It, it's as simple as can be. The, the only caveat, the only thing that I would really stress is make sure that you've inserted that image into the document before you try and do it. But other than that, it's a, it's a very, very easy feature to use. And one that I know a lot of users will appreciate. I talk to a lot of customers in, in my role, and, and this is one we got a lot of positive feedback on, which is really exciting to hear. All right, so those were the features that I had planned. Now, I do have one more honorable mention that I want to show you before I hand things off to Greg. And, you know, we had a lot of things to go through, as I mentioned earlier on, and, and Greg mentioned this earlier, we're cherry picking, you know, a handful of our favorite improvements. And we actually had an update just a few days ago. Um, so, you know, we're, our update cadence is, is constant. And you know, sure enough, we had one right before this presentation. And I wanted to pick something from that update that I think a, a lot of users will really appreciate. It's a small change, but it's a big one, especially if you're working a lot with kind of dynamically moving assemblies. And so in short, now when you go to measure and you select entities to measure, let's say I have this angle vice and I want to rotate it around, I select two faces, I get the angle value. Right, that's not new. So I can, I've always been able to select measure, select two faces, and it tells me the angle uh, difference between them. What is new, however, is now when I grab and drag, you're going to see those numbers dynamically change, and that is really clutch. It's important to stress. Like now, you can take those kind of ad hoc movements of your assembly and measure things without necessarily, you know, creating construction geometry or doing any of these extra steps. It's very easy to just grab and drag and watch the angle value change, right? And understand maybe the total range of motion or understand, you know, the, the clearances between two parts. There's lots and lots of examples where people want to be able to grab and then measure dynamically. And that's in essence what we can now do. Um, so it's, it's really no different than measure in the past. The only real difference is it's live updating. So you use the same measure that you've used in the past. If you're not familiar with measure, it's one of those features in Onshape that's just on. So if I select two things, you'll see the measurement there in the bottom right. It's not a separate button or, or part of the interface. It's just there in the bottom right always. And if you expand on it, you'll see the measure dialog, which gives you a lot more information. And you can also see that live dynamic updating uh, distances, angle values, all that kind of stuff. So I think that's one that people will really appreciate and um, one that that I know uh, just from feedback a lot of users are really taking advantage of. So that was my honorable mention, something I think a lot of users will appreciate, something we just added a few days ago. So if you haven't tried it out yet, please do. It's one of the um, more subtle changes, but one of the changes I think people are going to appreciate most. So... Without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Greg to dive into a little bit more. Thanks, Cody. And before you throw off that, uh, I just want to add one more honorable mention uh, to the decals and the fact that you can configure them. Like you can configure many, many things in Onshape. 
And one really interesting use case for configuring a decal is you can have different languages. Maybe you want the warning label in different languages. So you can have a different configuration for that and which will just refer to a different PNG or whatever image file you, uh, that you want to use uh, for those different language warnings. No, it's just a, a neat trick um, that some people might find useful. Yeah, I agree. Configuration is very useful. So. And it works with everything. I can show assemblies, I can show drawings, configurations as well. Very good point. Right? Yeah. But uh, moving on to a different section now, uh, I'm going to talk about surfacing. You know, surfacing for those that have never uh, really played with Onshape too much, or you're new to the Onshape. You know, welcome. I'm glad you can be at this uh, this webcast. Um, Onshape has a lot of great surfacing tools. And in fact, over the last 18 months or maybe two years, we've really, really ramped up effort into surfacing. Um, and so those of you that have been with Onshape for a while would probably have seen that as one of the, one of the many significant areas of, of improvement in Onshape um, more recently. So pretty much every time we have one of these uh, quarterly updates, uh, there are new surfacing things that we can talk about. And indeed, today is one of those times. Um, the first thing is with curves. You know, we have this new capability to create an offset curve on a face, uh, as the name suggests here. So basically, you can select a single face or a set of faces, and from the edges or some selected uh, number of edges, you can then offset and create a new curve. Now, that can also uh, be done. You know, There's a couple of different ways that you can measure the offset. Uh, there's one called a geodesic, which is following the path of the curve of the face. Um, and then there's a Euclidean measurement. Um, if you're a flat earth person, then you realize that the same things, those two things are actually the same. But just kidding, there are different ways of, of calculating these, uh, these measurements. Um, you can optionally split the surface that's underneath uh, with those new curves, um, allowing you to then um, perform some more geometric operations there. And there are interesting options for handling sharp corners, which I'll get to uh, in the demonstration in a minute here. The second area for surfacing uh, has been an improvement that we've made to our boundary surface feature, uh, which was introduced last year. And the new feature is allowing you to support match curvature or so-called G2 uh, matching between uh, the boundary of the new surface you're creating and um, the underlying geometry. So it's a pretty simple uh, enhancement uh, to the user interface. You just choose match curvature in there um, and there are interesting implications uh, because you can now use boundary surface in more situations where you probably would have had to try a loft or a fill. And boundary surface tends to be more efficient and of a higher quality than those other two methods. And that's not saying that you have to use boundary surface for everything. Indeed, there are very many cases where loft and fill might be more appropriate. It's just adding to the toolbox uh, of tools that you have available to you uh, to create high quality surfaces in Onshape. One tip for this, and I will show you, uh, is to use the curvature diagnostics and measurement tools. Uh, you saw a hint of that with Cody's last demonstration with the measurement tools. We have a lot of those tools available for specific curvature, tangency, and other surface-related things. Um, you want to use those to verify that everything is consistent, that you can actually create a G2 boundary surface in there. The next new feature that we added, um, and this is in the uh, in the surfacing section here, but although it could equally have been in Cody's part studio section, because really it's all one and the same. You know, it's the part studios where you build these parts, um, and it's called the body draft. Now, the body draft is a powerful new way to create draft on multiple faces of a body all at the same time. Um, we can do draft. Uh, we can draft faces that were really only possible if you used surface techniques to create isoclines. And in fact, now this new feature, the body draft feature, will automatically compute and create those isocline curves for you, uh, and you don't even you don't have to worry about that. So it does deserve to be here in the surfacing section because up to this point, you would have had to use a lot of manual surfacing techniques to achieve what we're going to do here. We also support non-planar parting entities, uh, symmetric draft, and also when you have a symmetric draft across a non-planar parting entity, um, you can also force it to match the faces uh, so, that, um, so that at that parting entity. 
All this is going to be much easier to understand in the demonstration, uh, but it's a great new feature uh, for advanced things, you know, castings, um, especially mold, uh, mold tools and all things like that. Okay, so there were some surfacing things. Um, we have one really nice usability uh, enhancement I want to talk about, um, and it's with computing the area moment of inertia or second moment of area for planar faces. Uh, this is a common engineering need uh, that you would like to do once you have some geometry uh, that has planar faces like this. Uh, you can just click on them and get the, uh, the properties uh, reported straight to you. Uh, it will even support multiple selections of faces as long as they're coplanar. And you can, of course, use this with a section cut. So maybe you just dragged a section cut through it first, and those faces that were created by the section cut are pickable uh, for this computation as well. And finally, um, you can actually change the computation with respect to a given reference frame uh, provided by a mate connector. So if you want to look at the computation in a different frame of reference, then you can do that as well. So that's a really quick run through. Um, I'm going to do some demonstrations now. Let's go back and talk about uh, offset curve on face. I have a couple of surfaces here and they're um, currently uh, just intersecting like that, but I'm gonna use a mutual trim feature to, uh, to trim them together. Uh, it's a nice feature that we've had for a long, long time. Um, now we've got this common edge here, I'm going to use the new offset curve. And you can see how long and how many more interesting and new curve creation techniques uh, that we've added into Onshape over the last, um, maybe since you've looked deeply at it or if it's the first time you've ever seen it, you know, this has a very comprehensive tool set for curves and surface creation. The newest one is the offset curve. Now we choose the edge from which to offset and it will create the curve uh, at some given distance. So I can just roll that down to say 10 or wherever. I can flip to use the other surface. There we go. I can put the, uh, you know, maybe make it a bit smaller. Um, and then I can choose the different computation or the offset type or the measurement types, whether it's Euclidean or geodesic in this case here, so that it will be a, a five millimeter measurement as you walk along this cylindrical surface. If I choose to split the surface at the same time, now we're actually going to have a face there that we can uh, do something with. And interestingly, and this is a one more thing, uh, which came in the la very, very last release from last Friday, um, this tangent line is now being, is, is being rendered as a phantom line style. Now, why did that happen automatically, you ask? And the reason is that it is now my, uh, my preference, which is, persistent across my sessions, uh, all the part studios, any document I open, these, per, these preferences are going to be remembered. So I don't have to tell it each time that I want tangent edges to be rendered in a phantom style. And I did see there was one com comment in, the, in the, the comment thread about this. In fact, it, it still takes a single click or basically a click on the view cube and then a click on the translucency to change uh, any of these options. So we hope that it is still usable, you know, a really good user experience for this. Um, the big benefit, of course, other than the preferences and you know them being sticky, um, is the fact that the view cube context menu is now much, much shorter. It's much easier to sort of visually uh, recognize here rather than having a really, really, really long list as it was getting to in the past. So that's a nice thing there. Now I'm going to just go back and show you those two curves that I had there. And I've deleted the faces because I did actually trim those, leaving me this little gap. Now there's many ways I could have done this. Uh, I'm going to fill this in. I could create new curves here and create a boundary surface, for instance. I could loft, I could sweep, I could do all sorts of things. Uh, in fact, this time I'm going to do a loft and I'm just going to use those two edges and make a curvature continuous loft on both sides and boolean them together, leaving you know a nice thing. And again, you can see the tangent edges are displayed uh, as phantom um, as before. I could have used a face blend. You know, I could have used many, many different techniques. The, the trick with surfacing is that you need to have enough of these tools in the toolbox to do whatever the way that you want to do it, rather than the one way the system wants you to do it. So that's one one use of offset curve on the surface. Now. Uh, I've called this one the Euclid, 
Um, it's a lid because it's a helmet. And it, I'm going to also just show you how the Euclidean measurement style works here. So in this case, I'm going to select the edges through a create selection technique I've got here, which allows me to select all of the loop edges together. And I'm going to say, make that a five millimeter inset and make it from Euclidean style of measurement. And now I've got my, my nice offset curve on the face here, or it's actually many, many faces. Um, maybe I'm going to run some kind of groove along here, maybe going to thicken uh, and split this uh, split these faces for, for some other uh, geometric modeling technique. Um, but I've got a nice curve in there now, and you can see it over here. Um, I, can, I can use this curve for all sorts of modeling purposes. Similar technique was used on this. This is a little bit more interesting geometry, I think, uh, a little bit challenging. So let's do it again, but let's make this a very small geodesic inset. And I'll use the same selection technique of the uh, the loop connected edges like this. And when I add that, you'll see is well, there's a lot of edges in there. So let's uh, let's shorten that list. That was something that we added a couple of releases ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so now you can see across this complicated area. And the reason I might be doing this is that maybe I'm going to specify the boundaries of some kind of ply that I'm going to put the composite here. So I want a, you know, an inset of a certain uh, amount for that particular ply. Um, I'm going to do it this way. And there's an option for how are we going to handle the gaps when we offset these edges in, there's obviously a gap. So I could use a linear extension like this, or I could use a round extension uh, like that and put uh, automatically put the, uh, the fillet edge in there, uh, of course. So, you know, the offset curve on face is a fantastically useful and powerful tool uh, to get these kinds of geometries, um, you know, these curves on even very, very complicated surfaces like this. Moving along uh, to the boundary surface, uh, G2 boundary surface now, and <laughs> continuing the theme of joining two pipes together, or in this case, two halves of pipes together. Uh, okay, so I've got a couple of curves here. These are bridging curves, which are defined, you know, just from some vertex to another vertex or some edge of a face, uh, and, and it's created a nice curve in there. I'm going to use that as two boundaries. I'm going to use these as the other two boundaries to create a boundary surface. So we've got that in there and we've merged everything together and it all looks good. So let's have a look at the boundary surface. And you see here, one of the edges is apparently set to match tangency at the moment. Oh no, I want to use the new feature, which is to make match curvature. Um, so I'll do that and you can see how it's a very simple, obvious way uh, that you would change um, you know, the boundary condition here. So when I do that, oh, in this case, it's telling me there's inconsistent boundary conditions. Um, so, you know, this isn't the best quality surface that we, we could have created. We have to investigate this a little bit further. And that's why I want to show you this measurement tool and a set of measurement tools we've got. If I, if I pick this edge and that face, um, I can instantly get the tangent angle, which is zero, which is great. But you can see here, there's a curvature deviation uh, that's not zero. And because I've got a curvature deviation that's not zero, it's unable to match curvature across, uh, obviously, uh, to do that. So, you know, you can choose to, to specify, you know, to zoom in on this and you can see exactly, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced now that the curvature of this curve to the face is not good enough. What I'm going to have to do is go and fix that curve. And it's always the case with boundary surfaces and surfacing in general. Uh, you need to have good curves um, to have good surfaces. So if we go back into that bridging curve, you'll see that I had, well, obviously on purpose, because if this is a demo, I'd set this to match tangency rather than curvature. So if I change this to curvature, now you'll see the boundary surface is happy. And if I measure that again, you'll see that the curvature deviation is now zero. Um, so that's a, you know, a bit of an extra tip. Um, don't expect just miracles to happen when you just set a new, uh, the new value. Make sure that you go in and check to see if indeed the curves that you're using as a boundaries are matching curvature continuous. Um, and, uh, and then you'll have a lot more success uh, to create some, some nice geometry like this.
Moving on to the next feature, which is the body draft. Now, I've used this deliberately because on one hand, it's the simplest possible geometry that I could use, uh, but it's completely impossible to face draft <coughs> or draft the faces of this uh, without a lot of surface techniques. In the old days, we would have gone over here and used the surfacing tool set again, maybe to create some isoclines, uh, an isocline uh, up here, which is uh, from a certain angle on this projection. And then we could have perhaps created some ruled surfaces off that brought the surfaces down to the plane, done some trimming, done some enclosing, and you know, we could have done it manually. Now there's a new option, which is the body draft. Now that will do a lot of that work, well, nearly all of that work for us. I pick the part I'm going to draft. I pick the parting entity, which in this case is going to be that plane, and it's already done it. Right? So if I put a big obvious angle in there, uh, you'll see how it's created that draft. Now that it's pretty impressive already. Let's make this a variable. I've already got a variable set up that I'll use as my draft angle. And the reason I do that is so that, you know, again, for demonstration purposes, it's very interactive that I can just play with this uh, over here. Now, the next thing is that I've set the pull direction for this draft feature to be you know, normal to this plane. Uh, but in fact, I could use something a little bit smarter than that, which is this mate connector. Now the mate connector is also has its angle um, being defined by this variable. So you'll see here, if I change this angle, it's almost like, uh, yeah, you can see the skirt that's being created around the, the, the model for the draft uh, is, is updating at the same time as well. So that's, that's nice and very, very powerful, obviously. We can continue with this now. We can make this symmetric. So to make, um, to make draft on both sides of this at the same time. Now you can see when I've made this symmetric and because this pull direction is not vertical, um, there's a little bit of an overlap uh, between the two sides here. Right? We can automatically fix that with the match faces uh, option here. Now there's a couple of options that we can do. We can just, you can see the, as I match the faces, it's going to pull this face out to match it at that edge on the parting entity. Pretty powerful, very powerful. <laughs> and then there's one more thing, which is the ability to force this to stay tangent. You see how there's an angle in here. And in fact, again, my line is no longer phantom, meaning it's no longer a tangent line along here. I can make this force to be tangent to face, and it will just bring it up to wherever it needs to be to be tangent. Now, there's one more line which is not tangent, which is where this split is occurring here. And again, I have a, a repair option here to add a radius to say, make a 25 mil radius in here to keep all of these uh, tangent as we go around the split. Now, if that's not all enough, um, let's change this parting surface or this parting entity to not be a uh, not be the plane anymore, but actually use a non-planar entity. Now, the best way to select things like this is always selecting from the parts list. Uh, this is a bit of a tip for, uh, for new users here. So let's just select that directly from the parts list over here. And you can see how now we've got a really, really complicated um, but effective uh, draft on this body. Now, this is a really simple example. Um, and this is also pretty simple. Um, but one thing to, to note on this one is that the body draft feature can operate on more than one body at the same time. So here I've actually selected parts one, two, and three all to go in there, and it will create the draft on those bodies as appropriate using those same techniques about matching the tangency of the faces at the parting line. And you can see how it's, it's added some geometry in here in order to enforce that matching. Um, and just to finish off this brief demonstration, what I did is then I booleaned those three bodies after they're drafted together and put the fillets on. And now I've got my final thing ready for casting, something like that. In my final or nearly final uh, demonstration, um, I'm going to look at the new area moment of inertia or second moment of area enhancement that we've made. Very simple part here. You can probably do this one calculation in your head, except for the fillet might trap a few people. But anyway, 
we have a, a very much easier way to do it, uh, which is to go to the mass properties, which is down here with these measurements that I've been using, choose the face instead of the part up here, and then pick the face. And you'll see here at the centroid, this is the area moment of inertia, and it gives you the values um, here. If we wanted to, we could choose a different mate connector somewhere else, uh, and it will update the values for that. Now, that is okay, um, but what if you have more than one part? Okay, so in this case, typical for a spar in a wing or something like that, you might be making up the spar from different caps and a web. Um, we can just select multiple faces in here, and I'll take off that mate connector, and I'll just use these faces up here and here, and now we've got the overall moment, uh, area moment of inertia for this beam um, spar section. Interesting, but let's do it on an even more complicated model. So this is a, you know, has a fair few pieces of geometry in it, these stringers and frames and the outside skin. And for, you know, some, some large model or system level modeling, I need to know the second moment of area of this section. So let's take a cross section through here and look at it from the side. All right. And now I'm going to do the same trick as before. I'll choose the face properties. And I'm going to choose all those faces at the same time, which are on the outside, you know, on the out, that, that cut um, plane there that we just made, that, that section cut. And very quickly or instantly, it gives us, uh, gives us the result there. So, you know, it's really, really simple to add these kinds of calculations and measurements, as Cody was showing you, and all the measurements I was doing with surfacing as well to your workflows. And that's part of the, you know, the user experience that we're so, um, you know, focused on providing. Uh, we don't want to send you off on, on strange workflows uh, into different tool sets. You know, we want to have this right at your fingertips um, as much as possible. So there we go. Now I'm going to just flip back here because of course there is one more thing. Uh, and the one more thing, um, was that back in, in in February and the beginning of February, Apple launched the Apple Vision Pro um, to much fanfare, and, and it's a it's a great new thing. In fact, on the same day as that launch, the OnShape Vision app was available in the Vision OS App Store. Um, so we'd been working on that up to the launch, and we we couldn't tell anyone about it, but uh, you know, obviously now everybody has seen it. So with the on Shape Vision app on the Apple Vision Pro device, you can experience, manipulate, and comment and do some interesting things um, directly on the On Shape um, documents. Um, really interesting is how you get an environment rendering uh, of the materials that you've set inside the On Shape model. And you get real time updates. Now, the, this is a really interesting thing because if somebody is else is collaborating, uh, say that they're on a web client on the other side of the world, but they're in the same document, uh, if they change position, if they change configurations, if they add new geometry or change the shape of the geometry, you'll see that instantly updating. It's because like any on-shape session, we're not sharing files. We're not downloading a file, converting it to some new format and uploading it somewhere else. We're not doing it that way. You know, we're just, we're literally operating on the single source of truth, uh, which is the database of the Onshape document. Um, so to show you this, it's a little bit tricky, but I'll try it. You know, this is a video that I shot at home. Um, and you'll see here me looking in my garage, wondering whether I sh can fit in this particular size and model car. And it's coming up in a one-to-one -one or 100% scale. And I was looking at, well, do I still have enough room to get in and out? You know, it's pretty tight in there. I've got to get another car next to it. Um, but I get this real amazing sense of the space. Um, it, it's really uncanny how you really, uh, you know, you're really walking around it. And you see where it's going a bit translucent there. It's actually a safety feature so that you don't accidentally walk into something that is hidden or into a hole, which is perhaps in the middle of there. So now I've just turned on the environment rendering and you can see the lights, uh, overhead lights are being reflected. Um, you've got some shadows, um, you know, the windows are clear and, and you can get some, some good uh, effects there. And, you know, I was really trying to, to see if I could fit it in the garage. Now, having purchased the car, now I'm uh, wanting to see if I should change the color of the wheels. And here I've got, I'm just manipulating an on-shape model of those wheels that I have 
and I want to see what it would look like with brighter, shinier wheels. So I can just go outside and throw them on there. And it's again, this is a really, really compelling feeling you get of the real time, the real space. Um, and you can just pull it up, pull it up close to you, have a look at it, examine, uh, examine the models, um, and, and so on and so forth. And once you're done with it, you'd hang it on the sky hook or uh, put it back to, to, where it, um, to where it belonged. The final demonstration here is with this model of a, an on tape model of a, of a dirt bike. And I just got a Slack notification inside my uh, Apple Vision Pro there. That's all right. So I'm going to put the motorbike on the floor. And then with a gesture, I can position it or rescale it. And you can see me rescaling it. And I can actually set it to real scale uh, to one to one. So once it's there in front of me, again, this is giving me an incredible sense of the feeling of it being there. And you know, you kneel down, you have a look and lie on your back, and you can look underneath it, see if you can get your hands up on the uh, whatever uh, filters. And I can see here that I've, I've got a problem with the radiator cap not fitting underneath that uh, that panel properly. So rather than doing anything else, I'm going to add a comment right now. And this comment, which I'm using the voice activation, uh, sort of voice to text. Uh, is to say, please make space for the radiator cap. As soon as I submit that comment, you can see that other icon came up. And that is that comment is now available in the Onshape document um, in real time. So, you know, it's an, it's an amazing, compelling experience that you can get. It's the best 3D experience you're going to get for, you know, in, an, in a device like this, uh, because really you can just pull things apart. <laughs> you can stick them where they need to go. Um, it's, it's an incredible uh, and it's an incredible device and way of connecting with, collaborating with, um, and interacting with the, the Onshape documents. So, Cody, with that, I will pass it back to you. Awesome. So just a couple of comments there, because I know that was everyone's mind is probably blown at this point. But that was an awesome demonstration. There were really two things that stuck out to me about the, the Apple Vision uh, Pro and the Onshape Vision app. And, and you already briefly mentioned them. But... Um, how natural it felt and how natural it looked, right? And and um, the ability to interact is, you know, we've all spent the, our careers, you know, staring at a flat mm -hmm. screen, and this is a totally different way of interacting with the geometry. Totally, um, totally. And and it's really really exciting. The other thing, and you mentioned this as well, but we are very uniquely positioned to take advantage of technology like this. Single source of truth, real time collaboration. We're, we're in a world now where you could put these on, put the, the object on your desk and have someone across the world change it in real time and you give real time feedback. And that is when you stop and think about the gravity of that, it's 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 awesome. So thank you, Greg. Um, I'm going to jump back over here and wrap things up. So I want to start. We have just a minute or two left. Uh, I, I want to uh, end things with a thank you. A thank you to the community. Uh, as always, the Onshape user community is fantastic. And a lot of the feedback uh, that, that you give us goes directly into the features that we've shown you here. Prioritization and how they work and all of that is very much driven by you. So we really encourage you uh, to continue that feedback. That feedback is invaluable to us. And Please commit, uh, Please continue submitting those uh, tickets. Please continue with the feedback in the forums. We watch it very closely, and um, you know it's something that we very much appreciate. So without uh, any further ado, I want to say thank you, everyone, for coming, and have a good day. Thank you very much.